again, welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, so uh, last week um, I mentioned that within the next few weeks, we're going to see David involved in four activities. Last week, we saw him accepting God's will. Well, this week, we'll be seeing him fight the Lord's battles in chapter 8 and showing God's kindness in chapter 9. And so as we dig into these chapters, I read the, these two chapters and we dig into them. I'm going to try to show you how you can apply these activities into your own life. So before I begin reading, let's ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord God, we, I, I am so thankful that you've brought us here together, Lord, um, that you have a plan and purpose for having everyone here and for hearing this message, for reading this, this, your word, Lord. And I pray that you bless everyone mightily, Lord. They may hear from you and... And they will, again, speak clearly to them. And, and anything that they, on those areas that they need, a, they need help with, Lord. So I pray that you will, again, bless this time, Lord. Open hearts, open ears. Remove all distractions. May we just focus on you and what you have to say right now, Lord. Fill this room with your spirit. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 8. The Word of God says, After this, David defeated the Philistines, subdued them, took Megath Amah from Philistine control. He also defeated the Moabites, and after making them lie down on the ground, he measured them off with a cord. He measured every two cord lengths of those to be put to death and one full length of those who, uh, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became the Lord's subjects and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. When he went to, when he went to restore his control at the Euphrates, when he went to restore his control at the Euphrates River, David captured 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers from him and hamstrung, hamstrung all the horses and kept a hundred chariots. When the Arameans of Damascus came to assist King Hadadezer of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 Aramean men. Then he placed garrisons in Aram of Damascus, and the Arameans became David's subjects and brought tribute. The Lord made David victorious wherever he went. David took the gold shields of Hadadezer's officers and brought them to Jerusalem. King David also took huge quantities of bronze from Beta and Barathai, Hadazar's, uh, Hadazar's cities. When King Toy of Hamath heard that David had defeated the entire army of Hadadazar, he sent his son Joram, Joram to King David to greet him and to congratulate him because David had fought against Hadadazar and defeated him. For Toy and Hadadezer had fought many wars. Joram had, Joram had items of silver, gold, and bronze with him. King David also dedicated these to the Lord along with the silver and gold he had dedicated from all the nations he had subdued. From Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Amalekites, and the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. David made a reputation for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in Salt Valley. He placed garrisons throughout Edom, and all the Edomites, Edomites were subject to David. The Lord made David victorious wherever he reigned. So David reigned over all Israel, administrating justice and righteousness for all his people. Joab, son of Zeruah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat son of Ahilud, was court historian. Zadok, son of Ahitub, had, uh, and Ahimelech, son of Abiathar, were priests. Sariah, 
the court, the court was a court secretary, Benaniah, son of Jehodia, Jehoiada, Jehoiada, was over the Cher- Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were chief officials. My name pronunciation still need a lot of a lot of work. So um, now uh, this chapter basically tells us three main things how David expanded the empire how he ruled and the team that he had to help him administer it so one aspect of David's success as ruler was his ability to be a level-headed diplomat at the negotiating table and a successful military leader in the battlefield He had to be, because when he came to power, his kingdom was surrounded by other kingdoms who typically invaded their neighbors at any sign of weakness. Now, even though Saul had strengthened Israel's military during his reign, he began to deplete those resources in his obsession to hunt for David. And as a result of that, the nation had a hard time defending itself against its enemies. So when Saul died and David became king, he wasted no time in in asserting his authority that God had given him. And he did this with a military campaign to expand the empire and improving the way that it ran. Now back when we covered 2 Samuel chapter five, we read about some of his decisive victories over some of those enemies who persistently attacked them. Well, the first 14 verses of chapter eight pick up where chapter five left off and tells us how David continued to fight the Lord's battles. So, also back in chapter 7, verse 11, God had promised that as part of his covenant with David, that he would give Israel rest from all her enemies. Well, here now he begins to fulfill that promise. First, the Philistines, Israel's ongoing enemy for more than 125 years, were attacked and defeated at Methig Ammah. Next, David attacked the Moabites, and when they were defeated, he used a unique method to put two out of every three prisoners to death. Those that survived became David's subjects, which implies that uh, the nation of Moab was now controlled by David, it became a vassal state of Israel. The Arameans then became David's subjects, and they, that, that uh, territory became also a vassal state. This nation consisted of a loose federation of city states, which rose to prominence the same time Israel's monarchy rose under. Saul and David. David first made an assault against Hadadezer, king of Zobah, at the area just north of Damascus, which was an area north of Damascus. Hadadezer had gone on a campaign to the Euphrates River to recover some of his territory, and in his absence, David, that's when David struck. His victory over the Arameans, gained him prisoners, gained him 1,700 prisoners, or gained him prisoners and 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers and 100 chariots. Before David could return back home, he and his men were attacked by the Aramean troops of Damascus. And again, he prevailed. He didn't let that get to him. 
he prevailed. And after slaying 20,000 Aramean men, he also there established an occupation force. And thus, there that area became another uh, area controlled by Israel, who were required to pay tribute. Finally, he did return to Jerusalem triumphantly, bringing gold shields and huge quantities of bronze as trophies of conquest. Well, now, having witnessed David's remarkable military success, verse 9 tells us that King Toy of the Aramean city-state of Hamath decided, you know what, I'm not going to mess with David. Uh, it's in my best interest. If I want to survive, if I want my nation to keep, my people to keep going, I'm just going to bend the knee, I'm going to capitulate and make peace with David. And so to symbolize this move, he sent his son Joram to David, along with a bunch of valuable items of silver and gold and bronze. And so David added these gifts to all the other spoils that he had gained from all his previous victories and dedicated that to the Lord. And finally, it says in verse 13 that David, his reputation was further established by defeating an Edomite army of 18,000 in the Valley of Salt. This again allowed him to place his troops in that territory. And it also now solidified the fact that the Lord made David victorious wherever he went. Now, the second part of this chapter we see next in verse 15 where we're told how he ruled. And there it says in verse 15 that David reigned over all Israel, administering justice and righteousness for all his people. What this implies is that in addition to being Israel's commander in chief, he also served as in a judicial capacity throughout the nation. So as the final court of appeals, he ensured that justice and equity were available to all his people without prejudice or discrimination. And so the manner in which he judged was a reflection of two important aspects of Jesus' character when he eventually comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Isaiah, in Isaiah 9-7, it says this about Jesus when he returns. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. And the third part, the final part of this chapter names are the names of the administrators who occupied key posts in his government. Now, the first person he mentioned was Joab, son of Zeruiah, who, again, we read about back when we covered chapters 2 and 3. Next was Jehoshaphat, who served as a court historian and supervised the preservation of important records. Now, he also may have been responsible for reminding the king of important matters that needed to be addressed. The third people on this list were David's chief priest, Ahimelech, who was first mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 22, and where we read that he had basically took off with David. He went with David after almost being killed by Saul. And then we also, and then also Zadok was his priest. Now Zadok, this is the first time he's mentioned, but he ended up serving both David and his son Solomon. Now it's also, here's something interesting I found out that, that uh, it's believed by some Jewish historians that his followers were known as Zadokites, a term that later became the Sadducees during Jesus' day. A fourth on the list was the court secretary, 
Sariah, who may have assisted Jehoshaphat in his administrative duties. But here's the thing too, that he also may have had uh, diplomatic responsibilities that allowed him to negotiate with other nations on David's behalf, kind of like what we may call our Secretary of State here uh, in our country. The fifth on the list was Benaniah, who was in charge of the Cherishites and the Pelethites. Uh, this group were elite warriors who served as David's bodyguards. And then lastly on the list were David's sons who were designated as chief officials. And again, more than likely here, it appears that they would have served as the king's co closest consultants and advisors. Now, although it may, appear, uh, it may appear that on the surface, this is really just more of an informative chapter, there's actually a picture being painted here. And that picture is that David is the embodiment of God's rule on earth. See, as God's chosen and anointed one, David is ruling as God himself wants his people to be governed faithfully, fearlessly, justly, and righteously. Furthermore, the way David leads now, now becomes the example for all future kings. And he also sets the standard that all of them will be judged by. But as we see, as we continue in 2 Samuel, he wasn't perfect. He made a lot of mistakes. Yet, even in his failures those failures became important lessons for every leader, future king, you know, or even a church leader to, to learn from if they wanted, if they desired to lead successfully. Now, before I move on to chapter eight, there's an important line here, there's an important phrase here in this chapter that I believe every Christian needs to fully understand. And the sentence I'm referring to is in the second half of verse 14, where it says, the Lord made David victorious wherever he went. Now, let me start off by first saying that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, makes it absolutely clear, without a doubt, that God has given us, born-again believers, victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about that. However, many Christians take this verse out of context, apply it to themselves and assume that it means God will always, will always give victory to his children and give them success in every situation. Well, that's not what this chapter shows us. If you read the entirety, what we've read so far, that's not what it's saying here. That's not what it's showing us. See, David, David's covenant relationship with God didn't mean that he was free to do whatever he pleased and that he would always enjoy success despite all circumstances. In fact, chapter 7 contains... In that Davidic covenant, it contains an imposing stipulation. And there it says that David was not permitted to build the temple of God ever. Yes, he's given military success in chapter 8, but does not get the one thing that he really, really wanted to do at that time. And that was to build a temple for the Lord. And furthermore, David isn't promised that he'll always avoid difficulties and defeats. Rather, he's promised God's abiding presence and assurance that he will be sufficient to empower him to fulfill his mission as king in providing rest for Israel. It's then important for, to understand 
that this phrase doesn't mean that David is somehow guaranteed success just because he's David. Nor does it mean that his future will only, will be full of success, um, will be full of success after success. Rather, it means that David's special relationship with God makes it possible for him to serve as a suitable anointed one for Israel. And as such, and because of that, God will be with him. So, in general, God provides, does provide a way out of trouble. But it does not mean there will be no more trouble for David. And so what this means for us as believers is that our relationship with God as his adopted sons and daughters is certainly no guarantee that we will always uh, we will always have success it will always meet with it will always be met with success especially especially in the way the world defines success the way our current culture and the world defines success rather god will empower you to fulfill the mission to which you were called just as David was able to become Israel's ideal king through the power of God's spirit. But the image of unmitigated victory and good fortune is a figment of human imagination, not the paradigm of our lives with God. Now there is something here that also that you can hold on to from this sentence. You can have victory wherever you go by remembering that God has already won the victory and has promised to strengthen you for the tax, tasks to which you were called to perform here in, in the church, in your community, wherever you're, wherever you're serving at, and even in the world as David defeated Israel's enemies. So today's believers, so you too can expect to accomplish successfully, accomplish successfully our God, your God-given ordained tasks with the help of the Holy Spirit. All of these victories that we see here in this chapter, all of David's victories then should inspire confidence in every single believer that God is at work fulfilling his word through his people. Well, so far now we've seen in chapter six, how David, in chapter seven, how David accepted God's will. In chapter eight, we just saw how uh, him fighting God's battles. And so now as I move on to chapter nine, we'll be seeing him Share the kindness of God. So let's go there now and read Second Samuel chapter 9. David asked, Is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul I can show kindness to you for Jonathan's sake? There was a servant of Saul's family named Ziba. They summoned him to David, and the king asked him, Are you Ziba? I am your servant, he replied. So the king asked, Is there anyone left of, of Saul's family that I can show kindness, the kindness of God to? Ziba said to the king, There is still Jonathan's son, who was injured, who, who was injured in both feet. The king asked him, Where is he? Ziba answered the king, You'll find him in Lodabar, at the house of Machir, son of Amiel. So King David had him brought from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell face down and paid homage. David said, Mephibosheth, I am your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him. Since I intend to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, I will restore to you all your grandfather." Saul's fields, and you will always eat meals at my table. 
Mephibosheth paid homage and said, what is your servant that you take an interest in a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's attendant Ziba and said to him, I have, given to your ma- I have given to your master's grandson all that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to work the ground for him. And you are to bring, you are to bring in the crops so that your master's grandson will have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, is always to eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba said to the king, your servant will do all my lord the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young, had a young son whose name was Micah. Mika. All those living in Ziba's house were Mephibosheth's servants. However, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. His feet had been injured. So by this point of his reign, David has definitely had military has been had been successful in the mil, or military success and he was also a successful administrative leader and so now that he's firmly established on the throne in a new capital and in a new palace he now directs his attention to the family of Saul in order to finish some old business See, back in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 14 through 17, David had pledged to Jonathan that he would never forget the covenant of friendship that had bound them together. And so the story opens with David asking a question. Is there anyone? Is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul? I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, in the Hebrew, the word kindness is a term that characterizes covenant relationships, whether between God and humans or simply among humans. Therefore, it it can be translated in many ways. Grace, loyalty, faithfulness, love, mercy, goodness. This particular act of kindness Shown, is shown when one member in a relationship, in the relationship, is in a position to help the other, even when that help can't be reciprocated. Such help is performed simply because of the deep and enduring friend relationship, the friendship between the two covenant partners. Thus, David's desire now was just to show this kindness to anyone that may be left in Saul's family. Again, because of the relationship, because of the friendship covenant that he had made with Jonathan. A man that he loved with, you know, with all his heart, you know, uh, he really cared for Jonathan. This is something that he really wanted to do without expecting anything in return. And so therefore he sent a former servant of Saul named Ziba and asked him, is there anyone left in Saul's family that I can show the kindness of God to? Ziba told the king that, yeah, there's one left. And he happened to be actually Jonathan's son. He also informed the king that he was the lone survivor, was uh, lame in both feet, and was living in Lodabar at the house of Machir. David then had him brought to Jerusalem. And as you can only imagine, uh, you know, as this disabled man is making his way to the city, he probably thought to himself that every step he took He was getting closer and closer to death. He probably thought he was going to get executed. See, as long as he was alive, 
you know, people thought that he would be a threat to David's rule, that he would lay claim to the throne since he was Saul's son or um, a descendant of Saul, Saul's grandson. Now, Mephibosheth hadn't been mentioned by name until we get to verse 6. But if his name does sound familiar, we read about his tragic story back in chapter 5. Well, by now, years had gone by. He was now an adult, married, and had a son who he was probably also worried about because now he was also a descendant of Saul. And he probably thought that his son's life was in danger. So when Mephibosheth met face to face with David, he immediately fa fell face down in front of the king, terrified of what was about to happen to him and his son. But in verse 7, David eased his fears by declaring that his family's, all his family's property would be returned to him and that he would always, from now on, he would always be eating at the royal table. And so now, overwhelmed by the king's guidance, Mephibosheth once again paid homage. In, in other words, he fell to the ground again and said about himself, what is your servant that you take an interest in a dead dog like me? But instead of responding to, to that question, David instructed Ziba and his 15 sons and 20 servants to farm Mephibosheth's land, new land that he had just given him, and to treat him as though he was one of David's own sons. But here's the thing, by letting him eat at the king's table, it also demonstrated how much mercy and compassion David had in his heart. And so here what we see him doing is fulfilling now the promise that he had made to Jonathan so many years before. Again, because of the loyal love he had for him. In this short story, Mephibosheth is a picture of the unbeliever. See, the word Lodabar speaks of an area that is dry, empty, unfarmable. There's nothing you can do there. It's all basically desert. It can't, nothing can grow there. It's dead. It's dead land. And the name Machir means sold. And so that's what an unbeliever is. A person living out in the dead, unfruitful world, in a barren land. It's a person living in a barren land and sold under sin. See, Mephibosheth was an outcast from the fallen house of Saul. And on his own, he was unable to come to the king and beg for mercy because he was lame. But the fact that David made the first move and sought out Mephibosheth reminds us that God, that it was God who reached out to us and not we who sought him. We were estranged from him and enemies of God. Yet Romans chapter 5 verse 8 tells us that God proved his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Additionally, once Mephibosheth was found, he was given great riches and a place of fellowship at the king's table for God to restore us and to bring us into his family, Jesus, his son, had to be sacrificed. He had to sacrifice his life. Because of this, our inheritance is much more than just a piece of real estate on earth. 
It's an eternal home in heaven with an eternal seat of at Jesus' royal table. The parallels to salvation are also obvious here because like Mephibosheth, we were helpless to come to God and our condition was hopeless because we were, we are part of a, of a fallen race. But by grace, we became subjects of divine favor. And we've now been elevated to a place in the family of God and made joint heirs with Christ. When the hymn, the songwriter, um, he wrote hymns, but uh, the songwriter Isaac Watts realized this when he discovered this, when the Lord showed them, showed him this, he wrote the beautiful words in a, he wrote these beautiful words in a hymn. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. So I also want to make this final point here. God's grace to Mephibosheth is a pattern for us in serving and ministering to others. Like David, we should seek out our enemies and seek to bless them. Like David, we should look for the, look for the poor, weak, lame, and the hidden, the outcasts of society, and bless them. We shouldn't, hide, we shouldn't keep ourselves from them. We shouldn't avoid them. We should look for ways to bless them. Like David, we should bless others even when they don't deserve it. And bless more when they, than, than, and bless them more than they deserve. Like David, we should bless others for the sake of someone else. And finally, just like David, we must show the kindness of God to others. Now, if you're here, if you're watching, listening to this message, whether it's live or later on you're watching this recording and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you've never accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, you're really no different than Mephibosheth before David sought him out. And here's what I mean. Again, at this, mom, at this moment as an unbeliever, you're poor, you're weak, you're lame, and deep down inside, you're afraid that if you were to come face to face with Jesus himself, that you'd have no excuse. Right now, as an unbeliever, you're separated from God because of your ancestors, Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden. Right now, as an unbeliever, you're separated from God because of your deliberate actions. Right now, you're separated from God because you don't know him or his love for you. You don't know how much he loves you. But like David, here's how God extends his grace to you. Although you've done nothing to deserve it, even though you've blown it and you're done you blasphemed God, you've you know, murdered in your heart, you lusted in your heart, you've, um, you've committed all kinds of awful sins against the Lord. 
he's still seeking you out. He's still calling you out. He still is asking for you to come. So God's kindness is being extended to you because or for the for the sake of another when you come to Jesus he will return to you what you lost in hiding from him and when he returns he will give you more than what you lost hiding from him when you come to Christ you will have privilege, the privilege of sitting at his eternal table. And when you become born again, God will receive you as sons and daughters with unfettered access to his throne room in order to fellowship with him anytime, any place, whenever you feel like it. You don't have to go to a temple. You don't have to go to a mediator. You don't have to go to a saint. You don't have to go to it. You can come directly to God and lay your heart before him. Send him your the petitions of your heart. Let him know what's troubling you, what's bothering you, what's going on. And he will be there to listen to you. Because now he's your your eternal father now. You become sons and daughters. And what parent would not, would just brush away their child and say, you know what, I don't got time for you. I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, yeah, again, as human parents, we mess up and we, we may do that, but God won't do that. God will not, you know, abandon you. He will listen to you. will take the time to hear you out. Now, you may think that he's not listening. You may think that he's not paying attention that, but no, he is. And many times if you just if you just stop and and wait and listen and get into God's word, he will speak to you. And the things that you need to know, you can come to him as a born again believer. But if you're not, then that relationship isn't there. That relationship can't be formed because you're still in your sin. He can't look at you. He can't, because he's a holy and pure God, he can't stand, uh, you know, the Bible says that it's kind of like our sin is like a dirty rag and he can't stand the sight of it. But once you become born again, Come washed and your washed uh, white as snow, and your sins are forgiven. And he can now look at you and smile and say, "That's my son. That's my daughter." And so, if that's what you desire, if that's what you want, I and you want to now leave Lodabar. You want to leave that desert area, that area that has no, there's no fruit. There's nothing there for you. I want you to come to the cross where, again, you will find the Lord. You will find the Lord there, and he will forgive you of your sins. So wherever you're at, this we desire. I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus into your heart. So I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And wherever you're at, I want you to Pray this with all sincerity, with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've sinned and confess that I've done nothing good to, to deserve your love. So now I ask you to forgive me of my sins, Lord. All of them, all my past, present, and future sins. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and 
that three days later rose from the grave. So now I repent of my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me and for saving me. And so now I ask that you fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, please reach out to us. We want to help you in your next steps. Maybe we can send you a Bible or, you know, we can just talk to you. Maybe if you're not here in town, we can help you find a church where you'll be able to hear the Bible being taught, where you won't go to a, a show or a concert or, you know, get your ears tickled, but you will actually hear the Word of God being taught. And if you're here in El Paso, I want to invite you to come to Fresh Vision Church and, and uh, yeah, just check us out. See if, you know, if you like it here, if you, you know, feel that you can grow here, if you feel like the Lord is calling you here, um, you know, we, we definitely will welcome you and I, th- I believe that you'll you will find a home here. So again, thank you for joining us this week, for those watching, and I, I pray that you have a blessed week. Well, goodbye and farewell.